Hello and welcome to the BNH event space. My name is Steve Miller. I work with Ikelite Underwater Systems. Uh, we manufacture camera housings for all the different brands of cameras. So we make it possible for you to take your camera underwater. And we've been doing this for about 50 years now. We're located in Indianapolis. Uh, in 2014, I was uh, a grandmaster in the underwaterphotography.com uh, annual contest. And today I would like to share Share some tips and tricks and uh, little things that'll help you with your underwater photography. What I'm going to be discussing is going to be more of the advanced uh, techniques for underwater photography uh, because a lot of the basic stuff is, is pretty straightforward. So I'm not really going to spend any time on macro photography. Macro photography is a wonderful uh, avocation to practice. But with macro photography, we're typically using two big lights. And the scenes that we are shooting, whether it's the size of your thumbnail or two feet across, generally the macro scene is going to be 100% artificially lit. This makes control very easy and that makes your results very consistent. But it's also very uh, simple compared to wide angle photography. When we start working with the wide lens, uh, you've got to balance multiple light sources, multiple types of light, natural light and artificial light. So that's what I'm going to try to give you some tricks and techniques today that'll help you with your wide angle photography. So. Let's uh, dive right into it. There's only ever been, and probably will only ever be, two rules for underwater photography. Get close and shoot up. Upward camera angles and close to your, to your subject. And these have been rules that have been in place since we were shooting with film uh, in the 60s and 70s, and they're just as applicable today. For the underwater photographer, we pretty much use two lenses two lenses only. One of them would be a macro lens, uh, 60 millimeter, 100 millimeter. I mean, there, there's a range, diopters. We even have super macro. But certainly, some of the most popular photography will be macro. And then the other would be a super wide lens, or a wide angle, super wide, a fisheye lens, for example. And if you look through you know, magazines or social media or whatever, at the most compelling underwater images that you'll come across, you're going to find upwards of 95% of them are taken with one of those two lenses. The super super wide or the macro. Now, the reason for this is because we need to get close to our subjects. Many times you're going to look at an image that looks like, I'll, I'll show you images uh, shortly here, that look like they were probably shot with a normal lens from a comfortable distance of 15 or 20 feet, when in fact they were shot from 12 inches with a super wide lens. So this is something to, to keep in mind. The be, these behaviors that we're going to do then are going to vary a little bit maybe from what you like to do when, when you're shooting uh, topside. So I'm going to start off with a technique or a a method. This is actually a, cat a category of underwater photographs called close focus wide angle. Howard Hall, Jerry Greenberg, all the, the great film guys from the 70s kind of made this uh, technique very famous. And for a lot of us, certainly for me personally during the film days, how to shoot these really eluded me um, because it's hard to understand exactly what's going on. A close focus wide angle, you topside photographers might uh, label um, forced perspective because what we're doing is we're using a super wide lens and then shooting it at a super close distance. So here's the way you shoot super uh, close focus wide angle images. The first thing you do is pick a subject, certainly an anemone, a coral head, a fish, anything that'll hold still for you. But this object preferably needs to be anywhere from the size of, say, a softball to a bowling ball to even a beach ball, but not much smaller. The second thing you want to do is put your dome port and your fisheye lens or your super wide lens very close to it. Uh, the distance here is un under a foot from the actual, and that's to the foam plane, from the actual uh, dome port itself. This anemone is probably about six inches away from the dome. So that's going to be your primary subject. We get close. The next thing we do is we shoot up. So we'll angle that camera housing upward. And a, a lot of, uh, you'll find a lot of very experienced photographers, if you shoot the wide lens for long enough, you'll learn to 
prejudge, you'll know what this lens is going to show you. So many times we'll shoot from the hip. We'll hold that housing out and up at an upward angle because we don't want to lay in the coral. Everything down there is sharp and stings and bites. And if you touch it, uh, the dive masters will come over and, and, and tell you not to. We, we want to never come in contact with the reef, yet we want to shoot it from six inches away. So one trick is to hold that housing out, look through preview it, now I kind of missed it. Do it again, do it several times. If you do this enough, you'll get pretty good at judging what the lens sees. From there, exposure. Since the camera is pointing upward, if you do a light meter reading, in most of these cases, you're gonna see a sun ball. And the sun ball, you know what that's gonna do to your light meter, right? It's gonna make your light meter swing up to the F16, F22, whatever. If you're looking for a rule of thumb, I find my images, I like them a little dark. If you rely on the camera's light meter, okay, and basically obey what it recommends, I think you're gonna find your images are too bright to the tune of about two stops. And that's because your light meter was designed to measure an average gray day. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna brighten up that water column. It's gonna kind of make it look a milky white. Now this could be a nice effect if you like that, but if you want the deep, rich blues that when we, what we, we get when we're shooting in good visibility, you're probably gonna to want to move that light meter down about two stops. Now, of course, there's a lot of ways to change your exposure. You can mess with ISO, shutter, but again, we're divers. We've got 45 minutes or so, and we wanna at least shoot several, ob several objects. So my recommendation for close focus wide angle is fix your ISO, set it and leave it. Clear tropical water, shallow diving, for me, this should usually be 160, 200, uh, 320 would be a, a pretty high ISO for me. So put it there and leave it there. And then the shutter speed, same thing, our, our flash sync, we're gonna put a set of usually 125th, 160th of a second, and again, leave it there. That leaves the only variable for us to change, the aperture and that's what we would bracket. So to make these close focus wide angle shots, you want to come into the subject very, very close, shoot, uh, take, a, take a test shot or look through the lens if you're able to, read the natural light, read the sun ball, go down about two stops and then shoot it. And we are big fans in these situations of TTL. Now I know a lot of you top side, man, top side guys uh, like to shoot manual strobe settings. Uh, personally, I'm a big fan of TTL. It's 99% of my images. The reason for this is very simple. When you come upon a large animal, say you've got a, a grazing turtle or a, or a whale shark coming by or a shark, whatever. When they cruise by, you're probably gonna expect to shoot them from 10 or 15 feet away. So you can set up your settings, your strobe power, whatever. But if you get lucky, and this might only happen one out of 100 times, but if you get lucky and they turn, and sometimes they will turn and come and see their reflection in their dome, and all of a sudden they're in your face, and now you're shooting a big animal, and you're shooting them from under a foot, filling the frame, these are very, very powerful images because there's so little water between the lens in the animal that they're very sharp and they're very crisp. It's almost like shooting from air. The difference in the sharpness of an image shot from this distance versus this distance is huge. Even the biggest, most powerful strobes that we take under, underwater with us don't count on getting good uh, color saturation much past about four feet or so. So. These are, that's the, the famous close focus wide angle. And now I want you to notice something, and it's the similarity of all these shots. Okay, these are a formula. These are shot exactly, basically the same way. You would come into the scene, and then you can start to move your strobes around and think about light and shadow in the case of this image. Um, I, push the strobes around so that they were only hitting the anemone and not hitting the rest of the reef. Here it's a little more diff difficult to do with the scorpion fish, but often the challenge for us as underwater photographers is to separate our subject from the background. Because even if they might be bright, beautiful reds or, or oranges or yellows or purples or whatever, the animal's job is to blend into its environment. So the animal can be beautiful, yes, but it'll also 
also be lost in the background. It's just a clutter of, of color and texture. And you look at it closely and say, oh yeah, there's a crocodile fish in there, but there's no separation. So what all good photographers are striving to do with every image is separate that image from the background. And controlling your lights and your lighting is one good, one good way to do that. Okay, now sometimes we don't really have choices about composition and things like that. When we shoot big animals especially, we're just hoping for a close pass. These are whale sharks uh, shot in Isla Mujeres, one of the few places in the world where you can get these big animals and also have a lot of visibility. This is gonna be typically at the surface. And by permit and by law, you're not allowed to use strobes. Okay, so this is all gonna be natural light photography. In a situation like this, it depends on the animals that you're shooting, but personally, I don't have a problem with some of the program modes at this point. I know all photographers, we like to shoot manual. We shoot manual on the camera, TTL on the strobes. But if I'm shooting natural light, I'm comfortable with, uh, in this case, shutter priority. If the big animal is slow, whale sharks are basically slow. They're faster than you, but they're basically slow. You can stop the motion of a whale shark with 125th, 160th of a second, no problem. If you start shooting dolphins though, if there's one takeaway from this, if you ever shoot dolphins, because I, I almost learned this the hard way, um, figure a 600th of a second or faster. These guys are fast, really, really fast. If you shoot them at a 250, shoot them at a 400, 500 of a second, they're going to look sharp to you on your viewer. And then you're going to get home and you're going to look at them on your laptop and you're going to see motion blur. So in these situations, I'm pretty comfortable with shutter priority. Certainly the light rays that are bouncing off the animals, those will freeze and stop better with a faster shutter speed. But we also want the depth of field. so. You can put it into shutter priority, but something I also like to do at that point is I'll go into my exposure compensation and I'll tell it to underexpose every image, usually about a stop or so, maybe even a stop or stop and a half. Uh, it's a little more fun, a little easier to pull out the, uh, the, the low lights than it is to try to find the highlights when it's, when it's been blown out. So, with these animals, we don't really have a lot of compositional control. They don't do what we say and they, they don't hold still. Um, and in the case of these feeding whale sharks, you have to get out of their way because they will literally uh, bowl you over. It'll be like hitting, being hit by a bus at a very slow speed, but you don't, again, you don't want to come in contact with the marine life. So what can you do to make your images st uh, stand out? Uh, one good thing to do is, is force perspective. I'm going to jump ahead to, to a favorite here, the 50-foot the whale shark. Uh, this is not a 50-foot whale shark. This is probably 18 feet. 20 feet. That's the average length of the whale sharks uh, that are in Isla Mujeres. But to make them look bigger, you can use a human. Now here's the thing, if the human is between you and the whale shark, your diver's going to look very big and your whale shark's going to look like he's 8 or 10 feet. But if you can get your buddy to be on the other side of that whale shark, all of a sudden the whale shark can look big and bold like he's 50 feet long uh, next to the diver. So. A good way to do this is when you see the whale shark coming, you and your buddy are sitting next to each other, give them a tap on the shoulder and have them break off from you. And then as the whale shark comes in to make his pass, they can come in behind again. These guys move slow and steady, usually about three knots or so. So if, they, if you do a good bit of kicking, they can come, by, come in behind the frame, just make the animal look like they're a little bit bigger. <clears throat> I love breaking the rules, and whenever I give rules like uh, get close and shoot up, uh, the exceptions to these rules are always a great deal of fun. Here's a straight down camera angle, um, and those sparkles that you see around them, the light rays that are bending, we're going to talk a little about, about where to find those and how to capture those uh, a couple minutes later.
you are allowed to dive under uh, to shoot up at, at whale sharks, um, but it's kind of difficult because you're not allowed to use lead. But if you do, and if you do shoot up, uh, sometimes you can get a little more interesting, uh, interesting perspective for them. And then certainly one of the most difficult uh, shots to accomplish are over-under. So over-unders are my specialty. They're my favorite kind of picture to take. My advice to you uh, for over-unders could go on for an hour, uh, but the the, the short version would be use a big dome, the biggest dome you can get. Um, the eight inch dome is what we like for these because the trick with over under shots is controlling the water line. Uh, and it's a lot easier to do when your dome is this big than when it's this big. So get a big dome for over-unders, and sometimes you might want to actually stop looking through the lens and start looking over the camera. Just pay attention to the to the water line. You're shooting a fisheye lens. You're you're getting everything in this range, right? So you're going to get that whale shark. He'll be in there. But the water line is is crawling up and down and crawling across your port. So sometimes you might want to pay more attention to the water line than what the actual animal is doing. <clears throat> Generally, people think of shooting over-unders in still flat water, and certainly that makes them easier. Uh, but with the fast recycle times that we can get on our cameras with, uh, or the burst shooting that we can get, it's worth trying them even if the water is rough and choppy. You'll just be wasting a lot more frames, and again, the key is going to be to pay more attention to what the water line is doing versus what the actual animal is doing. So this would apply to uh, sharks, whale sharks, manta rays, any of the big uh, animals that are out there. Uh, the one exception, as I said before, if you get into something that moves really uh, fast like dolphins, uh, that'll, that'll change things a little bit. And, and again, I'm talking about all sharks. Even the white tips, the reef sharks, they are not that, that fast. When I say fast, I'm really specifically talking about dolphins or something like marlin or, or uh, sailfish that are, that are feeding. Those, those will be kind of fast too. So, we go and shoot whale sharks with a hundred other photographers and there's a million pictures of them. The question becomes at some point, how do I make my images stand out from all of the other ones that I see? Because the, the typical frontal view of a whale shark, like yeah, like this one. This is, you know, the, the, the head turn. This is kind of be the kind of the classic, but, but this is an image that you're gonna find very difficult to tell from other people's images because this is pretty much the way most photographers are gonna gonna try to make their capture. So one thing you can do Let's play with your light, play with your light rays, try to get uh, below the animal. And in, in the case of this, and most of my images, you're gonna see that I'm, I'm always trying to work with light rays. If I'm shooting natural light, always trying to work with light rays. If you're shooting over wonders, by the way, a little tip for you, always make sure that sun is behind you, always over your shoulder. If you're doing stuff like this with light rays, don't be so afraid to have the sun in different places. But again, for over unders, we have such a, um, such a tonal range from the top side to the underwater part that you definitely want that sun behind us. So if I want to make my images stand out, if I want them to be strong, if I want them to be different and special, we should probably talk about art um, and the elements of art. What makes an uh, image more interesting uh, than another image? And I'm sure a lot of this is familiar to you topside photographers. We're working with lines and shapes, colors, textures, uh, light, space. These are the things that ideally would be going through your head in that quick moment when the whale shark's passing by you. But this is what makes an image strong, and this is what makes an image go from a photograph to a piece of art. The interaction and arrangements of all of those elements and in art into principles of design, specifically repetition, perspective, pattern, balance, rhythm. These are the things that you would love to spend a lot of time with a chair, changing lenses and everything else to, to get the perfect capture, but in fact, we need to make these things on the fly, so they almost need to become uh, intuitive. So, one of the things that <clears throat> One of the pitfalls that you may fall into, I, I know I certainly did for many, many years, is always putting your subject in the center of the frame. 
there's good reason for this. We're just trying to catch them, right? We're just trying to, to get them before they're gone, and I might only have two shots before they dis disappear. So I'm a, a big fan of going on spot focus and spot metering and put it right in the middle of your frame and just shoot them. But if you're in a situation where you've got multiple attempts that you can make with the subject or the ability to go back and shoot them again and again, try to break away from that because when you're always putting everything in the middle, it's, it's like we're hunting. A lot of macro photographers do this. It's more like we're hunting than trying to create a, a piece of art. So we go in, we find the subject, we try to fill as much of the frame as we can with it, and then bam, we got him, we got him, we nailed him. That's good, but when you go through social media and stuff, you'll find that this is the way a lot of people just shoot over and over again. Your um, one technique to try to mix that up a little bit is the back button focus, which has become a very popular with underwater uh, photographers today because it gives you the ability to lock in focus, then make your composition. Depending on the housing you're using and depending on how familiar with it you are, um, you can do the half touch. You know, the half touch to lock in the focus and then make your composition from there. Whatever works for you, but it's very easy for us as divers with our limited time to get into the mode of just trying to get the shot, just trying to fill the frame and make it sharp and crisp and properly exposed. And then it's only when we get home and we're really looking through our work and critically looking at our work that we realize, boy, this is a little repetitive. You know, all of, uh, I'm always centered. So mix it up a little bit. What makes this turtle uh, shot one of my favorites is the fact that he is a little bit off center and there's a little more of a story. There's a little more composition here than just simply filling the frame with his face. <clears throat> One of the problems with underwater photography, well, I live in the Midwest, and you, know, you guys here, uh, is that we have to travel really far to find clear water. Um, so some of the images, when you see this look, uh, this is a pool that I uh, created in my backyard, basically. It's a natural swimming pool. Here you can see that the ice, uh, the ice is over it. Uh, to get this shot, what I did was I cut a hole in the ice, and I put the camera on uh, time lapse to take a picture every second, and I put it on a stick. And then I shoved the stick down into the hole and, and then pulled it up, and I was actually just thrilled to see this. I didn't know if the paddlefish would come around or what the light would do, but you know, it's pretty grainy. But the, the way the light plays through ice uh, and the way the light plays through, through water uh, can be a lot of fun. And there was a small handheld light, a uh, little 1,000 lumen video light to uh, on the camera. Just I only put it there to make the camera focus easier. I wasn't uh, didn't expect for the uh, uh, the fish to want to get that close to it. Okay, so as far as your diver behaviors and uh, tips and techniques for getting uh, compositional elements into your underwater photography, the next thing that you need to think about is the power of editing uh, and what you can do later. And if anybody needs good editing skills, in post, it's the underwater photographer because we can't just throw on a polarizer. We can't just switch lenses. We can't really even critically look at our work underwater because we've got a mask and there might be water droplets or fog. Then I've got a housing and it might have the same. And then on the other side of the housing is the uh, the viewing window. So. Maybe if you're young and you've got really good eyes, you can critically look at the viewer. But generally speaking, when I look at my viewer, I'm looking for the composition and I'm looking to make sure that the exposure uh, is proper. And then in what I'm about to lead into is how you shoot for the edit. So pure editing, this is a, another paddle fish shot. Pure editing is gonna be pretty much what would you would be familiar with, which is just messing with your highlights and your low lights, uh, your color tones, the sharpness, uh, things like dehaze and clarity sliders are a boon for underwater photographers because it makes our visibility look clearer. Keep in mind uh, for you top side guys that we get very excited about 100 foot of visibility underwater, that is like, great day, stay in the water all day. 100 foot of visibility in the air, 
would be terrible. You couldn't even drive in it. Um, so if you're working in 30 and 40, 50 feet of visibility, it even becomes more challenging. And again, that's the reason we like our, our wide lenses so much. Back to the over-unders very briefly. Uh, balancing the light between over-unders is a challenge. There's a couple good ways to do this. One thing, a, a new rule of uh, shooting besides get close and shoot up is to shoot raw. And I'm gonna assume everybody here is familiar with that. The raw file is key to us. Um, and most photographers, will, when they're giving their buddies advice, will say, well, just make sure your camera shoots raw. Absolutely true. You, you need the depth of that file to bring out those highlights and lowlights. When you're shooting over-unders like this, keep in mind that they're gonna look really bad right out of the camera. The, the top is gonna be overexposed, the bottom's gonna be underexposed, and that there's gonna be a general lack of contrast. Uh, one way you can bring that out is to have lights down below. Another way you can do that is to um, try to get some, something besides open sky in the upper half of your photograph. And then there's some, uh, there's some other tricks for over-unders that we'll talk about. But a lot of times when we go back to portraiture of fish, jellyfish, animals, feeding stations, we don't really have a lot of choices. So all we're gonna do is come in, we're gonna try to fill the frame, make it sharp and properly exposed. But we can come in later and brush, we can use brushes, for example, and vignettes to try to release our subject from the background and try to separate them from the camouflage. Because every fish, every animal, no matter how colorful it is in our images, keep in mind, so is the coral and the life behind them. So there's always going to be a blending. There's always going to be a camouflage effect, unless it's white sand or dead coral, which is actually worse, uh, because to properly expose the fish when there's white sand or dead coral around is really, really hard, because your highlights are going to be uh, burnt out. These are cleaning stations. Uh, with cleaning stations, there is a quiet truce that occurs. And as a big animal, uh, which we certainly are on the reef, if you settle in near a cleaning station, especially if there's sand, we can't touch the corals, but if there's a sandy patch that you can settle in and kneel uh, by, I think you'll find that once you've been there for a minute or two, everybody will go back about their business because animals right routinely line up to take turns at cleaning stations, whether it's RAS, uh, like, uh, uh, what are cleaning this uh, sweet lips or on this coral grouper, uh, these shrimp will, they'll have a little cave they hang out and they will just flutter down from above to, to clean these fish. And you'll often see while this fish is, is cleaning, several other big fish and they're waiting in queue. And when you settle in next to them with the uh, camera, they'll just, nobody's hunting each other. Everybody has a quiet truce while they're waiting to take their turn at getting cleaned. Okay, so let's talk some more about editing. I had this image sitting around in my uh, files for a good long time as, you know, I, I almost never throw anything away, but there's nothing particularly exciting about it. It's, there's a lot of backscatter uh, in the water. Uh, it's a little hot on the edges, but if we, get creative with the edit and use our brushes properly, we can turn it into a totally different look. Now this is a little bit out there. This is what I call a very harsh uh, or a very severe edit, uh, but it's certainly, for my anyway, more interesting than the, the, the raw shot that's right out of the camera. So I always encourage my students, don't throw anything away. In two years, you might learn an editing technique that um, allows you to fix an image. The title of this is Composition is King. So I guess my one uh, exception of that rule would be when you look at your image, unless they're just wasted, if they're blown out highlights, sure, go ahead and delete it. But if they're not, if there's something you like about it, like particularly the comp composition, save it because you might learn uh, techniques and tricks later, even if you're not heavily into, uh, into editing now, uh, that will allow you to do something else with the, uh, with the image, even compositing. Um, I do a lot of work with sunset splits, and once the light 
level goes down and the sun is just about set and you lose all of your color, it can still be a good time to shoot because the sharks will actually get a little bit more comfortable then. These shots are not done probably the way that you might expect. Uh, we're not actually in the water with them. We're hanging over the side of the boat with our dome port, with our eight inch uh, dome, uh, half in and half out of the water, watching the sharks come in and just hoping, and just hoping and grabbing and, and shooting a lot of frames. A little pro tip for you on this, your camera's gonna get very unhappy about un auto focusing once that sun goes down. My personal recommendation is pre-focus your lens. Remember, these are fish eyes that I'm using, so our depth of field is great as long as the subject is you know, equal to or, or behind my focal uh, point. So go ahead and pre-focus your lens on about a foot or two and then turn the autofocus off. That way, your, your uh, camera will fire every time. It'll capture a frame every single time. If you're using your autofocus, nothing's worse than you're hitting the button and you're hitting it harder and you're hitting it faster and you're just not taking a picture because the camera is trying to find focus on something. So once it gets dark, turn that autofocus off. You can use modeling lights, of course, too, uh, but that can make the animals a little more hesitant to come in and it can also uh, create scatter. <clears throat> when we look up into the sun, uh, we, we talk about TTL a lot because I'm a big fan of it. It's always been kind of an Ike Light trademark. A lot of photographers, you'll find people that have written that, well, TTL doesn't work. Um, if you're shooting wide angle and your animal isn't uh, occupying, you know, maybe two thirds of the frame, they'll say, well, TTL will fall down and it'll, it'll read that water column and it'll overexpose your subject. I'm going to disagree with this because I know how many times I've taken my camera out of TTL. I can actually find them in my image library because there's only been two, maybe three times out of 30 years of diving that shot it, shot it three times and it's still just not getting me what I want. It's easy enough to, to switch to manual, uh, but again, the main advantage of TTL is you're not going to miss a shot. But one thing to keep in mind about TTL when, you, when you're shooting up, all it can do is try to light the subject, okay? If the TTL can't find a subject, this shark is actually way too far away to light up well with color. But what happens is the light travels through the water. It'll come back to the lens as light, but it won't come back to the lens as color. You follow me? So we typically say, and it's very true to say, that you need to have even big strobes, big strobes, two of them, you need to have them within about this distance of your subject. If you really want to saturate those colors and you really want to make them pop, absolutely true. But in fact, the light will pass much further through that. When it comes back, you're not going to have color uh, and really pop. All the reds, oranges, and yellows will be gone. It'll go to a blue cast because the, if you didn't notice, the, the color disappear in the water column, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. So eventually everything becomes violet. If you look in a lot of the diving manuals, they'll say something like at 30 feet or at 40 feet, everything has gone, gone to an indigo or a violet. My advice to you from personal experience as divers for photography, all of your color is gone in about three feet of water. I've gone to the clearest reefs in the world, Indonesia. I've tried to shoot um, natural light of anemones that are in water that's only two feet deep on a sunny, bright sunny day with the sun directly overhead. The colors, the reds, oranges, and yellows are pulled out of the water column almost immediately. And, and by the way, one reason for that is because, yeah, the water might only be two feet deep, but if my camera's here and my subject here and my strobe is here, the light's actually gonna have to pass three feet to the subject and then another two feet to get back to the lens and at five feet, everybody knows you start to lose colors there. So with an image like this, don't be afraid to take the shot, even if you know that you're not gonna be able to, uh, to light the animal up. Um, as perfectly as you, as you might like. Of course, when they come in close, once we get inside the three foot range, then we can actually get true colors. In images like this with severe upward angles, it's nice to use a fast shutter speed, 
uh, because that's going to freeze those light rays. Uh, make sure that you're balancing your light for the natural light for the silhouette itself, and then you can rely on your TTL to paint in your subject, whether it's colors, details, uh, or both. Okay, so those are some of the um, those are some of the ways to make your images stronger by using principles, elements of art, principles of design to make a stronger, more logical composition. And then we talked about using Lightroom and maybe even Photoshop to actually specifically Lightroom. Everything you've seen in here has been just Lightroom up to this point. The next step then would be involved pulling Photoshop into it because the way my workflow works, Lightroom takes care of everything with one exception and that's compositing. And compositing is another reason that I encourage you to never throw anything away. If there's something about the image that you like, even if it's just one, maybe it's just the light rays, maybe it's just the subject, maybe it's just the shape and the line and the curvature of the image, hold on to it because you might learn something a couple, you might be inspired by another image you see from another photographer. That's what happened with the octopus that was severely edited before I saw a picture that just highlighted the siphon and it took me back to when I'd shot that two years ago and then just do a rough edit. So this is the first composite. Um, I didn't actually make this. The two images are mine, but the shark is one image. The natural light is another image. And actually, the people that uh, Nautilus that runs this this charter made this composite for one of their magazines. It was the first time I ever saw a composite. This was over 10 years ago. Um, and it made me curious. And this is a little more difficult than uh, they're just shooting and using Lightroom. When you start working with layers, it's definitely more advanced. But if you do, it's going to open up a whole world of compositional pop possibilities for it because now you can start combining images. Again, this was a picture of a shark with a dark black background and a nice little uh, natural light sh shot of the cages. Put the two together and it becomes a more interesting story. Once you are willing to start considering this uh, compositional option for you in your work threat flow, I might suggest that you shoot for this. Get stock images for your library that you can come back and use later. In the case of this, this is in the Red Sea. It's a picture of nothing. There's nothing in there. Those, those dots, I don't even know what those are. Those would get cloned out. But I looked up and I saw a nice contrast. So this is that magic hour light just, just before uh, sunset where the sun gets kind of low. If you see contrast, you see light rays that you like, Use the fast shutter speed, make the capture, and uh, save it for later. Same thing with, the, with this. This would be a noonday sun straight up, but it's just a nice starburst. Both of these images are nothing. They're good for nothing other than compositing, because the chances of finding the shark or the dolphin or the ray or whatever, and having the light rays, and you know, to have all these come together, I mean, if you could hire them and tell them when to show up and what to do, maybe you could do it. But the, the chances of all of those elements coming together at once for you are, are really one in a million. So we can make it happen. The light rays that you see in this dolphin, this is what I call a soft layer. So those are the light rays that you saw from the previous uh, image where you can just use a translucent brush and just uh, paint them over top. So we have two images here. One is just the dolphins in the bottom and then the light rays was composited from another image. Same thing with this image. You recognize the light rays from the Red Sea that was shot the day before. This is Alex Mustard and a uh, uh, white tip, the oceanic white tip shark uh, in, the, uh, in the Red Sea right, right, right about dusk. Uh, again, those light rays, this, this combination, no. You, you could never shoot this pure. When you see this kind of, uh, I don't know what to call it, drama, uh, you can be sure that somebody spent some time in the editing suite uh, putting the images together. And you don't necessarily have to get too fancy, but um, 
I grabbed the wrong image here, but uh, basically I added two dolphins to this image. Uh, the two dolphins on the lower right corner that are looking up at her uh, were not there. And again, you can see my clone marks in the bottom because I grabbed the wrong image for this. But again, it, sometimes when you look at an image, it's there's elements that you like. I like the diver, I like the, the texture of the surface. I like the sandy bottom, but the composition, it just wasn't working. It was like there was a big hole uh, in the lower right corner that just needed something. It's easy enough once you've learned layering to grab a couple of dolphins from a previous shot uh, and put them there. Same thing with this, this image. Everything in here is natural with the exception of the shark silhouette. And by the way, if you haven't worked with compositing before, some of the easiest compositing to do uh, would be black and white like this, where you've got, or a silhouette where you've got a rigid uh, dark line. It makes it very easy to make that mask. Uh, without the shark, this just looked like a diver with broken legs. Uh, but when I saw the image, it looked like he was responding so Suddenly to something. So I pulled out a shark from the Red Sea and put it into a reef scene that was shot uh, two oceans away in, in, in Yap. Uh, same thing with this. I knew that the roundness of the eight millimeter lens uh, would play in nicely to the roundness of this uh, staghorn coral. The sun ball was there, nicely framed. The, the shot was okay by itself, but I think the fish just makes a little bit story of a story. Same thing with this one. Now you're going to start to recognize my shark because I don't have that many uh, silhouettes of the small shark, but you can insert them into, into many images. And by the way, depending on the category, um, most of these would be entered in the creative manipulative category. Uh, the rules are anything goes with that. So your compositing is, is, is encouraged, whether you're um, pulling something away or, or putting something in. These giant clams are one of my favorite uh, subjects. When I say giant clams, these are Wakatobi giant clams. So a really big one would be, this would be about the biggest one I've seen. But even if they are only about this big, if you get that fisheye lens right on them, you can fill the frame on them. This, um, this clam is about the size of a bowling ball, I'd say. So a pretty big one. One of the things you always want to look for when you're shooting is look for subjects that are perched up high. Because remember, you want your camera level low. You don't want to lay in the coral. You want your camera level low so you can get the water column and all the tonality that you get of the light diminishing from top to bottom. So we're always looking for something up high. I will shoot a boring Christmas tree worm or uh, just a piece of coral. If it's perched up nice and high so I can get that angle and all those textures, I'll shoot that and ignore the stargazer or whatever that's laying down in the sand if I, just, if I don't think I can get in and get any um, separate and I think that's the ability to walk away from a subject, to go to a set, to, to walk away to a famous or an important or an unusual subject because you look at it, it's just, I know I can't get there. Last week in Indonesia, um, a Sauron shrimp. I don't know if you guys have heard of them. They're just stunning. The most beautiful shrimp in the world. Purples and reds and burgundies. It's down in a hole. The dive master pointed it out to me. I looked at it for a full minute. And I just knew there's just no way. I can't get my camera in there. I can barely get light in there. So you look at it, enjoy it, but don't waste your dive doing that because again, we've got 45 minutes, 55 minutes, you might only come ac across two or three subjects to shoot on a particular dive. Definitely pick the ones that are perched up high that you can uh, get an upward angle on. Uh, back to the sunset splits. <clears throat> this is after the sun has gone down. Most of the shooters had stopped shooting at this point because the sky isn't colored up anymore. And this image sat in Lightroom for um, about six months. I kept looking at it, and there's something about the way that they were uh, relating to each other that gave me the idea to put them together in a composite. Um, this perspective obviously is impossible uh, in anywhere but the editing suite, uh, but it did. Uh, uh, it did place in the uh, creative uh, manipulative uh category. We call this the lovers. Uh, so the star system is from uh, Indonesia, from Wakatobi. The moon was shot from my backyard, and the uh, sharks were shot in Yap. So, and again, that was, that was an image that I hadn't... Uh, 
that I didn't see until a very long time after I had, had, had shot the image. Once you start working with your composition and once you start working with editing and Lightroom, I think you'll see opportunities to come up that, that you hadn't planned uh, on the first place and that they're delightful when they do. These were the kind of images that we were going after though, is, is sunset splits. And again, this is a situation where you're going to want to probably turn your autofocus off, although not everybody does, right? Don't think this is a hard and, f there are no hard and fast rules, um, but it's the best way to make sure your, your shutter uh, fires every time. So here what we're doing is we're working as a team because we're taking turns dunking our cameras and trying to catch the uh, sharks as they come in. So what you want to do is when you're reviewing, when you're, you've got to rest because it's really hard on your upper body hanging over this boat. When you're reviewing your images, shout out, shout out your aperture. Yeah, my, I'm shooting F16 on the sky. It looks really good. F16, then everybody will be like, I hadn't even thought about it. So they'll, They'll go in and, and, and start making those changes. But in a situation like this, we're starting this dive out, shooting F20, F22, and then we're opening up and then open up until it's you know around five, six as we lose that sun, till at the very end we're um, we're shooting basically uh, black skies. This is a big pregnant uh, black tip reef shark. Uh, with a nicely colored up sky. So the settings on this are going to be about f16 with 125th of a second with a uh, Tokina 10 to 17 millimeter lens set at 10 millimeters uh, on a Canon SL1. Sometimes, sometimes things happen very quickly during this. This was a fraction of a second and out of the thousands of frames that all these photographers shot on this trip there was only one shark they were always passing like there was only one uh, that actually came up and it happened I don't even remember taking the picture to be honest with you just you're getting wet you see the splash there when they're when they're getting they're bumping your strobes and bumping your dome port so <clears throat> sometimes you're just firing and grabbing but in the case of this I don't have all of the uh, I didn't do all the, the edits for you here, but when you do this, the top and the bottom don't line up because of refraction. So there's about a, about a, about a six inch skew between where it's head. It's a very easy thing to do in Photoshop. Just make two layers, put them together. It's a little more pleasing uh, to the eye. And if you want, you can put a drone in it just to uh, mix things up a little bit, color up the sky differently. This is another one. This is an image that I really liked the waterline on this. Obviously, totally missed the shark. The image is a mess. But I like this waterline a lot. And then here's an image where I like the shark a lot, but I don't like the waterline. It looks like I, it's too straight. There's, just, there's no real flow to it. When I put the two together, I think it works a little bit better than um, than they do uh, individually. One of the elements of art that we talked about earlier in the presentation is repetitive patterns. We call this, I call this shot wagon train. Uh, there is no Photoshop, there's no uh, weird editing going on. This is just coincidental the way they lined up. But these are the things that you want to keep your eye open for. Um, repetitive patterns are just pleasing to the eye. Here's an image where the clouds are overlaid on top of the turtle. This is shot literally point blank. The, the dome port is um, about four inches uh, from this turtle's head and almost a straight up angle, but there weren't clouds in the sky in that per particular day. So I had this image where I was just experimenting with exposure because I hadn't really noticed there were clouds until I did one of the hold the camera out at a severe angle. I looked up, oh, look at this clouds. It's very rare to have clouds in your pictures. This only happens when the uh, sea lays down flat. Ever since that dive, every time I go diving, I look for that flat sea. And if I see that it's laying down like a late, I totally change everything. And now I want to shoot very shallow and I want to shoot straight up so I can capture those clouds. Same thing with this one. This is a turtle uh, on a very dark dive uh, laid on top of an image that was, I was trying to get close to the spade fish and they just wouldn't. They kept moving away from me. Uh, so I put the two together to make it a little more interesting. And this was a strange one because something made me take this picture. It's a downward camera angle. It's 
it's got contrast. When it, when you see contrast underwater, grab it because it's so rare. It's the, the problem with most underwater photography is there is no contact, contrast. But the black divers, the black suits against the white sand appealed to me. And then about a year later when I was learning compositing, I put this into uh, my full moon picture and it was uh, uh, that actually placed in the creative category as well. And again, this is a very easy comp composite to make because of the clean, hard lines uh, of, the, of the moon. I talked about over-unders before. Uh, white tip reef sharks at night? Not me. I don't recommend anybody gets in the water with white tips uh, at, at night. Uh, I'm sorry, not white tip reefs, oceanic white tips. Reef sharks are fine. Oceanic white tips are a whole different story. Um, so we shoot them at dusk and then we get out of the water uh, um, before the sun goes down and we stay off the surface. You never want to be on the surface with oceanic. Oceanic white tips are different from every other shark. They are much bolder and deserve a lot more respect than any other shark. So to make a over under with this, this isn't even a composite per se. Uh, the reflection that you see in the top of the water is just a squiggle in Photoshop, so it's not even, this isn't two images, it's just a, I took a mirror of them, flipped it, and then made it a squiggle and, and laid it on top. Uh, I threw this in there, this is the natural pool. Uh, you guys have probably seen the tiny, tiny planet shots. This is done with an eight millimeter lens. You shoot a down, an up, a north, a south, a east, a west, and then you put them together um, with a program for tiny planet. It changes the perspective, everything. But this is where I do most of my shooting, all of the under ice shots that you have. This is where I can test out lenses and ports and products from Ike Light uh, without having to fly halfway around the world. Uh, you can see this is one of the setups that I use, a boom uh, for the camera housing so that I can submerge it and then control the camera housing with uh, either the laptop or an iPhone or any, any iOS device. Um, I, I've always found it wonderful that I can take pictures under the ice uh, sitting on my deck and not getting wet and cold and, and freezing. The other problem, the other, the reason for the boom is this is a very small pool so once you get in, it's like the cave divers and the wreck divers know, once you get into these freshwater environments, all you have to do is touch the bottom and a poof of a cloud of, of, of silt will come up and it'll take an hour or two for that to settle out. So the desire to shoot in the pool with actually without actually getting into the pool uh, was, a, was is an important thing for me. These are chorus frogs that come into the pool and uh, when I get home in, in a week or so, uh, they're due to come back. They come back every April for about four or five days. Up to 60 or 70 of them will invade the pool and they mate for two or three day, days and nights. Uh, they sing all night long uh, and then they're gone. They go back into the woods because these are not aquatic frogs, they're uh, woodland frogs. They come in, they mate, two, three days, then they're back in the woods. You don't see them again for another year and what's left behind are just tons and tons of uh, egg strands. Uh, so about two weeks after that, there'll be a mil million of the smallest little tadpoles. Two or three weeks after that, there'll be little frogs about the size of two of them would fit on your baby fingernail, uh, just hopping off in, into the grass. So <laughs> played with some color lights and some gels on there. This is just one of them behind, from, shot from behind, layered with the Milky Way or an abandoned church. Or, and this is the raw. This is what I would have been catching. This is before, this, this would have been the base image for um, a lot of the images you saw before of the frogs. In the case of this one, the clouds and the lightning, as you might guess, were added. Everything else is natural. And in the case of this one, it's really two photographs taken at the same place just a few minutes later. But since the camera's on a boom, which functions as a tripod, I used a 30 second shutter speed to make the air bubbles. I left the, air, the bubbler on to make the air bubbles into streaks and then captured one of the, uh, the paddlefish as it went by. And then this is the same thing when the pool is iced over. 
over where the bubbles hit the surface of the ice, the underside of the ice, and then they travel across it. Uh, again, that's about a 30 second exposure on top of a uh, 125th flash, flashless shot of the uh, paddlefish themselves. Uh, and then lastly, here's one of my frogs with the, uh, the Princess of Death. Uh, we did a shoot in Chicago where models uh, were made up by professional makeup artists and um, again, this is a two, two image shot. So the girl is one picture, the frog over under is another picture, and then layered them together. So hopefully this will help you with some of your, uh, for your top side guys, show you what you're in for uh, with your, uh, if you decide to take your camera underwater and some of you underwater shooters, hopefully you picked up a couple tips, if nothing else for close focus uh, underwater. All right, well, thanks a lot for coming today. Uh, this will conclude the presentation, but again, I'll be at the Ike Light table uh, for the next hour or two. So if you'd like to chat or look at some of the systems we make, uh, please come by and see me and uh, again thanks for coming